You know, during this Genesis series over the last few weeks, I've been telling you origin stories or Genesis stories, because Genesis simply means the origin story of something. So a few weeks ago, if you were here, we told the story of how Home Depot came to be, about how Arthur and Bernie got fired, and a billionaire, billionaire named Ken said, hey, that's a good thing, because you can finally start that store you've always dreamed of, and that's how Home Depot happened. And last week, we talked about a guy named Christopher Latham Scholes, who actually invented the typewriter, and I told you the story of how he collaborated with a guy named uh, Amos Dinsmore because the little hammers on his typewriter kept um, getting stuck. And so they had to find, they sort of had to mix the keyboard up where those, you know, letters that we use normally side by side wouldn't come up at the same time. So they basically scrambled the keyboard and created the QWERTY keyboard. And that's why you and I can't text. Uh, that's, so we've been telling origin stories all month. And... Um, Today is no different. We're going to tell origin stories, but they're going to be a little different in the fact that we don't know all of the names. Um, I was thinking of that this week. Um, I lost my razor knife, pretty important if you're a painter, to cut plastic and tape. And so fortunately, I have a van stocked with the things I'll need. And so I went out to the van and I picked up a razor knife just like this. And then it struck me that you need a razor knife to open a razor knife. And so I had this thing like stabbing it with screwdrivers and pretty much Mike Tysoning it. And it was like this comedy of errors trying to get this knife open. And I was like, I would like to meet the guy. Not who created the packaging. I understand like everybody has a job and someone had to create this packaging so it wouldn't be stolen. But somebody stole these, right? Like somebody is responsible. Someone is the genesis of the reason why we can't buy an item um, even a doll or a knife or scissors or for some reason, what is it with razor blades? Like razor blades, you have to go to like a shark cage and you know, like pass through the body scanners and, and get wanded or maybe I go to the wrong store. But I don't know, like for some reason, like someone stole so many razor blades that it's impossible to buy razor blades. And that happens all the time, right? Like I buy a lot of earbuds. I'm always like ruining earbuds or losing earbuds. But earbuds are so annoying to buy because it's sort of like, I don't know why I realize, it's sort of like a, a drug deal from Scarface. At a certain point, you're like, hey, do you have the key? I'll meet you back there. I need the item. Do you have the key? I mean, it's weird. And finally, you get the guy with the key who meets you behind the thing, and you get the earbuds. But I was thinking, like, someone had to start this. You know, there's a, there's a genesis of this process. There's an origin story of the person who stole so many earbuds. Um, and here's the thing about it. I was thinking about this. Like, there's always someone um, who ruins it for everyone, right? Like, there's always someone. If we trace things back, and I've, I've been talking to people this week, and I realized, like, if I handed you the mic this morning, every one of you would have a story from your work or maybe your house. That would probably get awkward. But, like, we used to be able to do this, but now somebody spoiled it for everyone. You know, like, we used to just be able to take days off when we were sick. You know, it was just sort of a trust thing. And then that one guy, you know, he missed every week. So now we have to bring a doctor's note. So I have to choose, like, am I going to go to work sick or am I going to actually go to the doctor, which makes me sick? Like, I don't know. It's weird. Like, every one of those things in life that's sort of difficult, you know, how did that law get passed? How did that razor blade get in the shark cage? How come that I can't open my kids' toys on Christmas morning because they're so difficult to unwrap? It's because someone... Someone stole something, someone did something wrong. Someone, just like your mom used to tell you, this is why we can't have nice things around here. Someone ruined it for everyone. Um, and we've all got examples of that in our life. You know, like, hey, the teacher used to be pretty cool about letting us turn in stuff the day after as long as we were gone that day, but not anymore, because that one guy would miss every time. The you know, and it's like always that. Um, now, here's the thing about the Genesis story in the Bible, because we've been talking about that, too. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, is just the origin story, and it's got numerous. It's actually not one origin story. The first week, we talked about the origin story of sort of the earth and everything around us. And last week, we talked about the origin of humans, of men and women, how the Bible says that came to happen. But it's another origin story that we're going to talk about today, which is basically the story of who ruined everything for all of us. And 
even though this morning I can't tell you like who caused this travesty, you know, why I can't get my knife out of the package. I can't tell you the first guy to steal one of these. But the Bible actually like points fingers, names names, like, and it tells us this. It says, yes, Adam's one sin, and from last week we learned that Adam is the name given to the very first man. So if you're wondering who ruined it for everyone, why we can't have nice things around here, Adam, the very first man. It says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Now, I know right now like, some of you are pushing back, and I don't blame you. Like, wait a minute. I wasn't there. Like, I, it's, if Adam existed, you know, you're telling me Adam existed, but you're also telling me that he did something wrong, and it's my fault, or it's changed everything for everyone. Now we have problems everywhere because of what one did. That's not right. That doesn't happen in real life. I don't believe it. Yes, actually, you do believe that. The problem is most of us can't even remember a time before something like that happened. I can give you one example. Some of you will remember. In 2001, a guy named Richard Reed, you know him as the shoe bomber, put bombs in his shoes and tried to take down an airliner. That's the reason, that's the origin story, that's the Genesis story of why you have to kick out of your Timberlands when you go through security at the airport. One guy put bombs on his shoes, and now, and speaking of airport security, some of us can remember before 9-11-2001 when you actually used to kind of go to the gate with your family and how different life was then, but because of one guy or a few guys, everything changed for everyone. That happens all the time. Thank goodness in 2009, there was a guy, I can't pronounce his name, but we know him as the underwear bomber. Um, Thankfully, he failed, or we would have to take off our underwear at the airport, and I think that would be... Actually, I don't think that's true. I was thinking about that this week. These are the things I think of, so you don't have to. Like, We probably wouldn't have to take off our underwear in line. It would be more like you would just go through this machine that gave you a wedgie. Um, and if you, no, seriously, and then you'd get pulled out of line for the atomic wedgie. If they, that's, that's the way I'm fit. If you were in junior high, you know the atomic wedgie is much more thorough. Um, never mind. But that's sort of what I'm thinking. But one person can ruin everything for everyone, and we experience it all the time. Every law, if we kind of went back, like, why do we have this law? It's because somebody did that, right? And somebody, they're like, we got to make a law about that. And they make a law and we just do other things. And we even try to make different laws, like hate crime laws. I don't understand them. Like, I've never met like a loving stabber. You know, the guy who's plunging the butcher knife into you is not going, I like you, but I just got to do this. You know, I don't, it's so weird. Like, we keep making more laws and I understand why we do. We're just like, this is wrong and it should stop. But the truth is, like, we make more laws because people, someone, and then more and more of us, um, we sin. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. The Bible talks about this one guy, Adam, who was the first human, and also the origin, the genesis of the sin, the guy who ruined it um, for all of us. Now, understand, and we've said this every week, the problem with Genesis that a lot of us struggle with is we try to make it a how. You know, like they go, well, now I've read Genesis, so I can explain to you how creation happened. No, you can't, because it doesn't actually tell us, but it tells us sort of the why of why things are the way they are today. That's what Genesis stories try to do. Like, I told you that Arthur and Bernie got fired and started Home Depot. Just because you get fired next week, you're not going to be able to start a chain store because you read that story. There's not a lot of a lot of how, it's just why. So let's just sort of read through that as we have every week. And this series is a little different because a lot of times I don't read all of the scriptures because I'm not very good at it. But I just feel like you should at least see it on your screen while I'm mumbling through it because I want you to know what the Bible says about these stories. Now, you're not required to believe this. In fact, you read lots of things you don't believe. But I'm just telling you what the scripture says, and then I'm going to tell you what I believe about it. And so I at least want you to see it, because a lot of times we think we know these origin stories, and we just don't. So Genesis 3 says this about the origin of sin. It says, Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day... <laughs> starting out with a talking snake right away, so hang on, hang on. Uh, one day he asked the woman, and that's the snake asking the woman, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit 
from any of the trees in the garden. So notice he says, you're not supposed to eat the fruit around here? What's up with that? And she says, of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. And if you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent said. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So the Bible says that the origin of sin is like a magic tree and a talking snake. So I just want to get that out there. Yes, I read that correctly. I understand that. Now, here's the weird thing to me. And I know you're like, what, the talking serpent or the magic tree? No, the weird thing to me is she didn't seem surprised when the snake talked to her. That's the weird. I don't know. I've always thought of that like... They had had conversations before because I'm telling you, like, if a snake came up and talked to you for the first time, you would be like, Adam, those mushrooms we are eating, I don't, I don't think those, you know, maybe we should, like, I don't know, like, they had talked before or something, like, this snake talked, it's weird, um, but I want to read to you something that you probably also didn't think of unless you're weird like me and you think about this stuff a lot, but here's what God said, and we read this last, last week, but I want to tie it into this. Here's what God actually said about the tree in the center of the garden, because notice the snake came to her and said, so you can't eat any of the fruit around here? That's, that sucks. But she's like, no, we can eat all the fruit except for the fruit in the middle of the garden, that one tree. And in fact, we're not supposed to even touch that. But I want to read what God actually said from chapter 2. It says, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat its fruit, you're sure to die. Now notice, and I want you to catch this, like God just said, all the trees are open to you. You can you take whatever you want. This is, this is buffet around here. Um, one tree, don't eat it. Now notice he didn't say don't touch it, don't look at it, don't point at it. So what we have an example of is since God didn't say this, obviously Adam, either, either Eve made it up, but I really don't think Eve made that up. I honestly think Adam told Eve, don't even touch it, right? Because that's what we do to our kids, right? That's the start of legalism. Churches do that all the time. They're like, you know, like, uh, you, you shouldn't get drunk, that the Bible says, and we all know that. Our bartender tells us, don't be drunk and stupid. But what churches say is, don't drink alcohol at all. And the reason why is for the same reason, like, if you never drink it, you'll never get drunk and stupid and get a DUI, so we're going to protect you from that. And then someone drinks it for the first time and go, well, that didn't make me drunk or stupid yet, and I didn't get a DUI, so you're wrong about that. But that's exactly what Adam said. Adam said, you know, don't even touch it, Eve. Don't, don't go near it. God said not to go near it or you'll die. And he sort of, sort of starts this story with false premise, and I call that legalism because we do it all the time. Churches love to do that. Parents do that. You know, like, you know, don't, don't go out in the street or you'll get hit by a car. Well, the first time the kid goes in the street and not hit by a car, he thinks you're lying, but the truth is, if you play in the street, you will get hit by a car. It'd be better to say, don't go out in the street because you're not old enough to, but we do that all the time. So anyway, another thing about this, and, and, and I'll just deal with this because all of us sort of struggle with this, is why God would sort of put one thing in the middle of the garden. You know, and it's not even like he hid it off in like a locker somewhere. It says in the middle of the garden, there's this tree, and he said, don't touch it. And all of us sort of struggle with that, and I think a lot of us kind of go, oh, well, God's setting them up, right? Because, of, you know, we kind of say, well, hey, I've got kids. If I put a, okay, it doesn't even have to be kids. It can be me. Like if I put a plate of brownies on the coffee table and go, hey, you're going to have anything in the house, but don't touch the brownies. You know, like there's going to be some fingerprints in the brownies real quick because, you know, that would be me. I would like, as soon as no one was looking, I'm paw print in. I mean, you saw me do that with a cake a few weeks ago. Like I couldn't resist. And so we kind of feel like God is sort of putting this thing in the center of the garden that people can't resist and if we're being honest, and it bothers us because we're kind of like it's setting them up. It's like it would be sort of his fault, right? Like, why would God do that? So I just want you to, like, I'm not going to beat up on you if you feel like that because I think most of us feel like that at some point. I just want to sort of offer you an alternative to think about that I've been thinking about a lot. Like, why, why would God do that um, if we make it like that? Like, why would, why would God put something, one thing out there right in the center and go, just don't touch that, not that one. You can't have that. He didn't say don't touch it, but don't eat it. Like, everything else is cool. Um, I realize that 
we do this all the time, and it doesn't make us a bad parent. Because in our example, in our mind, we're kind of like, oh, if my parents would have put one pan of brownies in the middle or, or put some candy on the table and say, don't touch that, I would have definitely done it because it'd just be impossible not to. But that's really not what God did, if you think about it. Let me, let me ask you this, and, and I don't know what your parents were like. If your parents were like, I don't know, sociopaths who were trying to kill you. This is not going to work. You don't have good remembrances of your parents. Or if you're a parent who's a horrible parent, this isn't going to work. But let's, let's pretend that we're good parents or had good parents or at least know a good parent. And so <laughs> I just feel like I have to say that. I don't know why. No one in particular is coming to mind. But, like, you could be a good parent and have electricity in your house, right? Like, even though electricity kills kids, right? Like, I mean, that's true. Like, and every kid at some point wants to stick a key in the outlet. That's why we have those stupid white things that I, can, I don't know how kids get them out. I can't get them out. We have them down in the, I was trying to get one out in the nursery here today and I couldn't get it out. But it's, I guess I don't have enough fingernails. I gotta get me some nails. But anyway, it's like we could have electricity even though it's dangerous because we go, well, it's a good thing to have in our home and we have to warn our children. We have to keep them away from. <laughs> There's a legend in our family, the record family, um, about the stupidest kid who ever lived. And this kid was in the tub, in the bathtub, um, and um, his dad was a redneck and uh, stuck a electric heater on the ceiling, which is kind of like the version of those cool heater lights when you get out of the bathtub, but he just like screwed an electric heater to the ceiling and ran the wire down the wall, and this kid stuck a pin in the wire while in the tub and almost killed himself and shut the lights out to the entire mobile home and I was that kid. So I just sort of under, <laughs> it's true, I don't, I don't necessarily remember it, I've been told, but I don't remember a lot of things now. That's just part of it, but I believe it to be a true story because mommy wouldn't lie to me. But, I, and she said, my mom said that the thing that I said is they came into the room, into the bathroom, and I was a little kid, I wasn't even in school yet, and there's like <laughs> all the breakers blown, or it was fuses back then, and the fuses are blown. There's like this safety pin sticking out of the wire going up the wall. And I'm just like all fried and freaked out going, I didn't do it, but nobody touched that. You know, <laughs> like lying about it. But, but we can have electricity, right? What about steak knives? Like you could, even if you're a vegan, maybe you need to cut something, uh, turn up. I don't know what vegans cut, but like you have sharp knives in your house and you would go, well, that's not good for children to have, but it's important that we have it or scissors or how about a swimming pool? I mean, kids, I mean, I know I'm bumming you out. I'm like telling you infant, infant mortality. And like, this is the reason why we don't have a swimming pool, not because we're poor, but no, like swimming pools kill kids, like more than almost anything else inside the house you could have or outside the house you could have a swimming pool. Um, how about medication? You know, all of us would go, yeah, we got some medication. We try to keep it safe, or we try to keep it away from the kids, but we don't, like, throw out all the medication house. But kids, so all of these things, and what about the Internet? As your kids get older, the Internet will kill your kids. It'll kill us. Like, it introduces some of the most horrible, dark things that you could possibly be involved in, but we kind of go, it's important that we talk about safety. It's important that we watch this, but it's important that we have this because it helps us. Um, automobiles, my goodness, like, I mean, I don't want to be mean, but you guys are all putting your children that you love in these metal death boxes and driving, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, and then they're going to turn 16, and they're going to be the ones careening towards you in their metal death boxes, and so there's like a lot, my point is, lots of very good parents who love their children, who wouldn't want anything to happen to them, have things that are potentially dangerous inside their home, um, and we kind of go, hey, don't stick a safety pin into the extension cord while you're in the bath. Well, we don't have to say that because kids are not that dumb. But we, we say to people, like, don't stick the key in the light outlet. And, hey, we need to check what you're doing on the Internet because there's dangerous things out there. And, man, I'm going to have to ride with you a long time before I give you the keys to the blazer. You know, we do all of those things, but yet these are dangerous things, but we love our children. So I don't see God, you know, he, he putting just something really, really wonderful and delicious that's just dangerous there and sort of daring his kids to touch it. That's not what happened. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is an important thing. Like, all of us want that at some point, right? Like, all of us want our children, at least. We want them to grow up and know the difference between what? right and wrong, between good and bad. We want them to know when they're being harmed. We want them to know when they're being scammed. We want them to know what is true and not true. And so God had that there, and he said, hey, 
don't eat this, you'll die, not yet. And I don't want to speak for God, and I don't know what was going to happen, but I know that's a good thing. It wasn't like, like, if God put, like, the tree of peanut butter cups in the middle of the thing and said, if you touch it, you will die, I'd be more on the side of people going God was just being cruel. And, but, but it wasn't like the tree of peanut butter cups, you know? It wasn't that or it wasn't. I'm just trying to think what way. Or, ladies, ladies, not the, not the tree of really expensive purses and cute shoes. You know, don't touch that. That's, you know, I'm stereotyping horribly. The tree of Pop-Tarts and porn. I don't know, like something that was just bad for you, but you wanted it really bad. I, that's why that came to my mind. That's horrible. But like God didn't just put something bad in the middle and go, don't eat that. If you do, I'll kill you. Instead, there's like, there's this thing, this important thing, knowledge of good and evil. My goodness, that's going to be really important for humanity, but not yet, right? So is it possible that we could go, hey, the internet's great, but you don't need to be on that site now. Don't, don't, don't get on that. That could kill you. And, um, so let's read on. Maybe, maybe keep that in mind. Just, just something to think about, something I've thought about. And it says, the woman was convinced. And she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her. So he's standing right there like... She's like the test pilot for the fruit. If you notice, like, he just lets her do it. And at that moment, thanks, guys. We're, we're awesome, aren't we? At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now, notice something right away, like, Sin is pleasurable. Like, I always say this, but it's true. Like, we often go, well, you know, I really enjoy that, so it can't be sin. No, it probably is. Like, if you're not sinning and it feels good, you are doing it wrong. Like, this is good fruit. It was great. She said it was fantastic, and sin is always pleasurable. So in your sort of checklist, you go, well, I know God says not to do this, but it's really good. Eve would say the very same thing. And notice also that it spreads. Like, Adam is right there with her. He's part of this whole deal, and in fact, God lays the blame on him, and Scripture does, um, and sin spreads. So remember that. A lot of times we'll go, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm clearly not going to join them. I'm just going to be there. And this is not about, like, you should hide in a bomb shelter in your backyard and not be around sinners because you're a sinner, and so you'll be with yourself. Or this is not about, like, locking your kids in their closet till they're 18, even though it's not a bad idea. But it's just a little cramped in there. But this is about understanding, like, if you're hanging out in a place with people who clearly are there to sin, um, don't be surprised when you find yourself doing that. But some reason, we're always like, I'm as surprised as you are that here I was in this situation and that happened. No, you're not, because sin spreads. And also notice that sin has um, long-term consequences and short-term benefits, right? Like sort of back to the thing of Adam told her not to touch it or someone told her not to touch it. Um, it had to be that moment when she took that fruit in her hand and she touched it and she didn't die. She had to begin to doubt God, and we all do that. Like, and when she took a bite of it, and she's like, this is good. This isn't bad. I don't know what God was saying, like holding out on me. This is awesome. Um, but God said you would surely die. He didn't say immediately. He didn't say if you touched it. He said you will surely die if you eat this, and that's exactly what happened. And the same thing happens to you and I. Like, we start out in sin, and we go, oh, yeah, just try it. I mean, and then we get close, and we touch it, and we look at it. We go, well, it looks good. And then we try it that first time, and in fact, it's always the first time's the best, isn't it? Like, you go, whatever the sin is, you go, oh, I get to do this. This is amazing, and eventually you have to do whatever that sin is. Um, but we have that moment where we doubt God because we're like, God said this is a sin, but it feels great. Like, other people are doing it. Like, my friends are all doing this, and... It's not hurting me, right? Like, I'm not dying. I'm not, this isn't ruining my life like mom said it would, but you know what? Long term. I always says short term benefits and really long term consequences. And so um, it says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then, the, which is always a good plan to hide from God. Yes, I've tried it as well. You're like, hey, God won't know this. Yeah, he's pretty good at that. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And Adam replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Um, yeah, he's been naked the whole time. And so God says, who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked, 
Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And the man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit. And I, I ate it, sure, but it was her. And then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? She said, The serpent deceived me. That's why I ate it. See, here, here's the thing. And isn't this true also when we think about the why, not how? Um, sin always leads us to shame and then blame, and then eventually separation. And you might be uncomfortable with me calling things sins. That might bother you. You might go, oh, I don't even believe in sin. Well, maybe you don't believe in sin, but you believe in sin because you've experienced this. We all have. We do something, and guess what? Because, you know, it all goes back to one guy ruins it for everyone because we have that same, like, we know what's right and what's wrong. And, and I know you're going to go, well, I don't feel bad about it. No, you don't feel bad about it now if you've done it for a long time, but in the beginning, all of us know. And we have that little, it might be a tiny little sort of pinprick in our heart, or we might have really strong consciousness, and it just tears us up inside, but it doesn't matter. We have the knowledge of good and evil, and we began to do this thing, and then shame comes, and we always blame. We say, well, it's this society's fault, or it's my friend's fault, or I wouldn't do this if I wasn't so depressed. And in the end, we all sort of get back to blaming God. I mean, it's just what we do. I do that all the time. Like, God... You made me, you know, you made me to enjoy that. You made me like this. You made me, and, and, and that's kind of where it came back to, and then eventually um, separation, and we see that in our relationships, and we see that in our lives and in our work relationships, and our home relationships, again and again and again, shame and blame, and initially, eventually, sin kind of works itself out into separation. But that's the why. That's not the how. This doesn't, you can't read this and kind of go, oh, well, so I know how to stop sinning, or I know, like, what happened in a sense of everything. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't even understand this whole story. I'll just tell you. Like, I believe it, but I'm not telling you I understand the mechanics of how, like, that one sin of sort of I disobeyed God, and now we know what's right and wrong because it's weird because of what it feels like to me. I'll just tell you what it feels like is, you know, we kind of say man was sinless, and then sinned. It's more like man was innocent. Like, they were like kids running around in the garden who didn't know right or wrong. You know, like, they're naked, but it doesn't matter. They don't know. Like, your kids at a certain age, like, when they're little and, like, you've got company over and they run out of the bathroom swinging a towel over, that's funny, you know, and you're like, oh, they're so cute. Like, at 15, that's deviant behavior, you know? <laughs> Don't ask me how. I wasn't that kid, but like, they run, you know, like, it changes because they know at a certain point, and so, in sort of why not how, I just want to read you um, what God said would happen to the snake and to the woman and to the man, and just kind of see if this tells us the why things are, and says, then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you're cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild, and you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And we believe, and we're going to have a, a series called Pop-Up Christmas, or the Great Big Book of Christmas this year. This is probably the first time the story of Jesus popped up in the Bible. It's pretty interesting. So secondly, what he said to the woman, we'll just kind of move through this, and then I want to kind of put it back together. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. I don't want to see any, like, elbows or poking, none of that. And here's what he says to the man. And to the man, he said, since you listened to your wife, and you ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. And all your life you'll struggle to scratch a living from it. And it'll grow thorns and thistles for you, though you'll eat of its grains. And by the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat, and you'll till you return to the ground from which you are made. For you are made from dust, and to dust you will return. Now, here's what, if we just kind of take the, the why. Um, snakes are creepy. Still creepy, right? Like, I, I know people are like, I'm not scared of snakes. I know, but you don't want to snuggle up with that. Childbirth hurts. Don't know, but I've heard lots of stories, and I've been there, so I would believe that one. Uh, marriage is a struggle. Yes, Judge. <laughs> Jeff and Nicole got married yesterday, but they probably know this by now. Like, marriage is never easy because of sin. 
Making a living is hard. Yeah, that's still true. Last time I checked, you know, as of Saturday morning, that's the way it was. I don't think it changed since. And death is certain. Like all of those things are still true thousands of years later. And so the story goes on, and I want to kind of end with this idea. It says, then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for, for Adam and his wife. Leather pants were the first clothing. I just want you to know that. And then the Lord, <laughs> so they're biblical. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and they take the fruit from the tree of life and they eat it? Then they'll live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent them out to cultivate the ground from which he was made. And after sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So the story ends not with God killing Adam and Eve. The story ends with sort of them being kicked out of the house, if you will. The story ends that, like, you can't be trusted here. You broke your commitment. Like, our relationship is not going to be the same because now you're going to be sort of responsible um, for what you did. And to each of them, he's like, hey, things are going to be different. Like, now you're going to have children, Eve. <laughs> And I don't want to tell you, I mean, I hate to tell you, but it's really going to be painful. And there's going to be a struggle between you and your husband forever. And Adam, no more sort of hanging out naked in the garden and just goofing around with the animals. Whatever you're doing, you know, like, no, 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 you're going to work hard till the day you turn back into the dust you came out of. And, um, so I just want to say to you this morning, like, I don't know how you came in this morning. I don't know how it's sort of your, your picture of what sin is. And I'll bet for many of us, because I've felt like this many times in our life, our concept of sin is sort of the concept that our kids have when we keep them from, like, playing with electricity or, you know, like, being unlimited access to the Internet when they're seven or all the things that we want to do that are dangerous. And we kind of go, well, dad's mean or mom's mean because they won't let us and they don't understand. Um, and so I don't know how you came in, but I'm betting like many of us came in this morning kind of going, God makes these lists up. And in fact, he told people not to eat an apple. I mean, that's how God is. God just sort of makes these rules up. And then when you break them, he punishes you. Um, I just wanted to give you the alternative, um, this story from Genesis, this, this origin story of sin that's really nothing like that. It's a story of a God who loved his creation, who created everything good, even this thing that they sinned with, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, very good thing to have. But sin happened not because they ate the apple or because, you know, we have so many blame stories, like because the snake said or because Adam listened to Eve. You hear that in arguments. I might have said that once or twice. Like, well, but that's not what happened. Really what happened is man and woman together decided that they couldn't trust God to know what was best for them. And so even though he said, hey, this is bad for you, they went ahead and did it anyway because they felt like God was holding out on something that would be good. And see, here's the truth about that, if you think about it. Like, we all do that, right? Like, all of us, I don't care who you are today, at some point, has, and, and we know good from evil in our hearts, like, we have done something that we kind of know, like, God said not to do that, but I don't believe him. Like, I, that was a long time ago, or that can't still be true because this is great, and he's holding out on us. And so, yeah, he might be angry and punish me, but it'll be worth it, we even say to ourselves. And so we kind of do that same sin. We don't trust that God knows what's best for us as his children. And um, I don't know who the guy is who stole the first razor knife, you know, probably many, many. And I don't know, then, like, somebody said, well, we got to put it in this impossible thing that no one can break open. And there's probably a kid with a razor knife stealing razor knives as we speak because that's what we do. But I just know when I look at packaging and I go to the airport and I go through life and I, I realize, like, all around me, like, I have to put a code into my phone, like, a thousand times a day because someone might steal it. Or I have to sign a 40-page agreement and hit agree when I want, like, a free app. And I'm like, how is that? It's because there's sin in our world and somebody ruined it for all of us. Um, and I want the guys to come back up and play another song. But it all comes down, really, that all of us think, if we're honest... Like, I know better than God. Sure, God said not to do that, but I got a feeling that that looks 
pretty enjoyable. And I've seen other people do it, and they're not harmed, and so maybe I'll just, and so I just want to leave you with this. It's not hopeless. We will all do that. We all sin. But I want you to notice what Scripture said. It says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new light for everyone. See, here's the thing. One person, we know this from life, like one person at the office can spoil it for everyone. One person in the family can spoil it for everyone. One person at the airport can spoil it for everyone. But the Bible says that one person, one amazing person, one person sent from heaven, the Son of God, could fix it for everyone and create a right relationship. And so let's pray. Dear Jesus, um, thank you for having the fix for this mess we're in. <laughs> it's amazing when I think about it. Like, not only would we all do the same thing at some point that Adam and Eve did, we do it all the time. I've done it this week. I've, I've distrusted you and said, hey, I'll do that anyway because I know better than you, God. Um, and I'm always wrong. And we're always wrong. But God, thank you for the fix. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that for your forgiveness and mercy. In your name we pray, amen.